Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at a first submission by Lindsay of her horse Soon. Soon is a seven-year-old thoroughbred that she got off of the racetrack and has been working with for a little while now. And I want to say off the bat what a great job you're doing. Um, I, of course, have watched the whole video a few times, and uh, it's just really wonderful what you're doing with this horse, and it's great to see somebody in the hunter world um, waking up to the possibilities of this type of training, you know, and reestablishing the classical principles in the hunter ring. And of course, in the fox hunting uh, arena as well. Um, you may know that I was a joint master of a hunt at one point in my career and have hunted since I was young. And actually my first big professional job was also as a uh, trainer, as a hunt trainer for a family in Unionville, Pennsylvania. So uh, as a as a real huntsman, that is, you know, who actually rides cross country, you realize how important this kind of training is to horses um, in order for them to be safe cross country. I mean, how often we saw, you know, horses coming out in standing martingales and hollow and or horses that had never been out of a ring trying to gallop cross country. And uh, if any of you have ever seen that, it can be quite a disaster. And I spend a lot of time out in the hunt field waiting for ambulances for people. And, you know, who brought horses in the hunt field that were being held against the hand and you, know, you just can't ride that way if they're not developed correctly uh, because you will get seriously hurt. And uh, to me, it takes more skill to ride cross country, you know, in a hunt field correctly and well. And that is to ride your horse independently of the other riders in the field so that you are safe. The people in the hunt field generally who are not safe is the people who ride nose to tail because, of course, if their horses get separated from one another, they're not really under control. And. They usually go crazy. I'm sure you've seen that if you've been out in the hunt field. Um, we used to always um, bring in the local hunt clubs, that is the you know the show hunt people for opening hunt. A lot of them would come as they would be invited. And I saw many of them fall down because these horses are just so out of balance and they're hollow. And the point of riding a horse across its back before I get on to evaluating you, is just that to make it balanced on all four legs. You know, when a horse's head is up and its back is hollow, it's on the forehand no matter how high it's lifting its legs. So if it hits a hole or something like that or some uneven ground, they can come right over on top of you. But anyway, once again, it's great to see you, um, a person who's interested in the hunter field, uh, getting back into this type of riding because this is really the foundation of it. You know, when I began riding hunters, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, the people who rode well, you could tell that they were riding their horses over their backs. Their horses looked very different. They were balanced on the weight of the rein. There's nothing, you know, worse than trying to gallop a horse cross country holding on to its mouth the way we see people doing around in show rings these days. So once again, getting on to you here, this horse started out very, very nicely. Um, in the walk, they're nice and quiet, though a little bit hollow. And I thought when I first saw this horse and watched this tape a little bit, um, so I saw it go on a little ways, I thought, hmm, he's a little stiff and, and hollow. But uh, you, you do a beautiful job of just, uh, you know, coercing him into a lovely and relaxed frame as you go on here. I think you could be a little more active in that a little bit, but not a lot. That is, you could take a little more contact. Your contact's a little bit... Um, unsteady at times. I love it right there when he stretches into the contact and you just keep that slack out of the rein. So the one thing I would say to you as a rider, and I think you're already aware of that because you mentioned it in, in your um, email to me, um, just getting the contact a little more consistent. Like right here, there's too much time when you have no contact and that he's walking along, his head is coming up, and you see how you neck his, his neck looked in that position. And you can see this horse is not well developed but he will be if you keep doing what you're doing. If you look behind the saddle there, of course, there's a little bit of dip and he's a little high headed. And what everyone needs to remember why this is also so important to horses is that when horses are developed correctly in the stretch, what happens is their withers actually pull up through the shoulders and the horse's body actually changes. That's why so few horses today look uphill because they're never getting trained correctly. So they never get that time to develop their top line and to have that change happen through, through the withers. Um, but yours certainly will if you continue on in this way. It's just, now, this walk is starting to look much better. It's starting to swing actively. Now, the only thing I would say for you as far as a rider goes, other than just I would like to see you a little more consistent in the contact, is just don't let your head drop. You know, it's perfectly fine to look down, but try to do it with your eyes rather than your whole face, so to speak. And I'd just like to see you flatten the shoulder blades into your back a little bit and lift your chest a little bit, even if you are a little more in a hunt seat, that is letting your upper body be a little bit more forward. Now, that's perfectly okay with a shorter stirrup like you have. 
because you can balance through the center of your body. The difference is when we ride dressage, that is in a full dressage length, which I wouldn't advocate on this horse at all. You know, that's one of the other things that people miss in dressage riding today because A, they think if you're not sitting to the trot, you're not doing dressage. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. If you're on a hollow horse, you're not doing dressage. No matter what kind of dressage saddle you're in or how fancy the horse is and what a fancy, incredible mover it may be, if it's not working through its back, you're really not doing dressage. So um, I love what you do. You are doing dressage here, and uh, this is really nicely done. Once again, I'd just like to see you keep a little more contact, flatten your shoulder blades, just lift your face a little bit there so you're just, you have a tendency to be looking down quite a bit. Now, I would like you to encourage a little more swing in this walk. I think this could get a little more swingy, and it certainly does as you go on. I have a feeling you could get to this place a little quicker if you just you know, took a little contact and just softened his mouth just a little bit more to encourage him to stretch into the contact there a little bit. And when I saw, say softening his mouth, I'm not talking about pulling his head back. The contact with your reins should never shorten the neck backwards in the body, the way I'm sure you have seen many horses doing. Um, this is really lovely. Now look how all of you, you know, anyone watching this, watch as soon as his head goes down, how the back legs start to swing. And this is what we have to train ourselves to start looking at the back ends of horses. You know, I've actually seen articles in big magazines about dressage now talking about how, oh, the horse has two engines, one is back end and one is front end. No, it doesn't. It only does that if it, the horse is extremely hollow. Um, so, Nice start off in the I like how you didn't try to attempt to hold his head down in position. That's just what I encourage people to do. If a horse isn't really consistent in the bridle yet, just start up your trot. What I always tell people is don't expect your transitions to be consistent if the gates themselves aren't consistent. But this is lovely how quickly he gets into the stretch, and that's just what you want to do. Had you fought him about the transition trying to fight his head down, you know, you would have had a battle on your hands because he wouldn't have been comfortable in the transition, and it would have taken you a lot longer to stretch the horse. So especially with a horse like this in the beginning stages, don't worry about those transitions between gates until we can keep the horse consistent in a particular gate itself. So it's really not, once again, I'd like to see you just coming along there. The only thing I would say is I would like to see you take up the contact a little quicker. It's the only thing about your riding that I have anything to say about at all in terms of that, other than your shoulders. But this is looking better now. Once you started trotting, you've flattened your shoulders a little bit and lifted your chest. That looks better. And once again, that's really good how he's swinging. Now, that's where you want him. And once again, look how completely different the horse looks. Um, you know, very often what you're going to find if you're one of the only people doing this around an area where you are, where people are very uneducated about how horses develop. And once again, I'm often amazed today. You know, I learned this, at least I, I began to get a gleaning of what I needed to do by reading the books of the classical masters. And I took a lot of lessons from people who weren't very good. And I went away thinking, well, that wasn't it, you know, until I found, but because I, I had a pretty good idea of what I was looking for from, from uh, the books and the literature that I had been studying for years, you know, and once I finally saw it, I said, oh, that's it, you know, so it's quite clear, you know, and you'll find, you know, no one ever rides like you're riding now and goes back to riding the other way because it would just feel so horrible to you. Once you've actually felt the horse's back swing and you feel that you understand that a horse can go light and supple in the bridle like this one is now doing, and that's really good. Once again, notice the deeper he gets his head and neck, how all that bottom of his neck softens up. He doesn't have that u neck muscle underneath there anymore. And in not much time at all, you'll be amazed at how quickly this horse is going to start to fill out behind the saddle. His whole neck will begin to thicken. We don't really have to bring the horses up. We simply have to let them go through that change of life, so to speak. That is the withers pulling up through the shoulders, which happens over time with correct development. And it takes about two years to, for that for that to fully develop. Now, once again, if you were, you know, if you're training horses and you're starting them as babies, it, you know, if you're starting a three-year-old by five-year-old, by five of two years of this kind of work, its muscles will be stretched up, and that is, its withers will be stretched up, and it will be much freer in the shoulder and well-developed over the top line and begin to be developed collection. But if the horse starts at seven or 11 or 20, it's the same thing. It takes the same amount of time. And unfortunately, people, you know, they buy a seven-year-old or a 10-year-old and they think, oh, it should be doing this or that. It should be able to do this or that. Well, if it's never been correctly trained, it's not going to. This is wonderful what you have right here. Look how he's starting to swing. Now, I feel like you could just push him open just a little bit more. I feel like he could just open up his stride. I feel like there's a little more than you're getting. Um, I, w I would love to see how you have this horse shod, just out of curiosity. I just would love to see what his feet look like. So next time, maybe you can just email me even some uh, some pictures of his feet. I would just like to take a look at how he shod or if he even has shoes on, because I can't tell in this and you don't tell anything about that. Um, 
but this is really good right there. Just a little more active. Once again, I said I'd like to see it swing just a little bit more, but this is really good. And I love how you're keeping to just simple things that the horse can do. Once again, one of the biggest problems that people encounter and the reason we see so many people fighting with horses these days is they're simply asking the horse to do things that they're physically not capable of doing. That is, or they've pulled their head and neck up into a position that makes everything uncomfortable. And that's basically what happens. If a horse is hollow, it is unbalanced. If a horse is hollow, it's on the forehand. It doesn't make any difference how how high the horse raises its knees. Look, I mean, look at a saddlebred, for instance. I mean, they raise their knees up, you know, around their ears, but they're completely on their forehand. Because the back end isn't anywhere near the front end. The back end isn't coming under and taking the weight of the horse and rider combined. So um, this is what we're looking for. And this is going to really develop beautifully in this horse. Once again, I feel like it could just open a little bit more. But you get there before you, you know, you're getting this horse to wonderful places. And you're so quiet in the way you're going about it. You know, you can just imagine this horse just working into a, a, a you know, a beautiful animal for you. Either, you know, of course, uh, for competitive dressage or if you just want to do field work uh, or jumping, whatever you want to do with him he's going to be a nice enough horse for you to do that it's really well uh, wonderful if you can develop him on in this manner and once again you can see how he gets a little hollow and that's instructive for everybody here watching because once again you educating your eye is so important that we start to look at the back ends of horses and this is a perfect example because when he comes up you know he so clearly changes behind and as soon as he stretches down you see the hawk begins to make a circular action you see him more circular you see him tracking deeper under his own body and once again I am perfectly fine with how you're going about this you know I'd like to see it become more consistent and I'm sure it will because you know I think if you just you know we're a little more proactive in it. That is getting the slack out of the reins a little quicker and softening a little quicker. But there's nothing wrong with this. I mean, that you are you are so on the right track. It's wonderful, you know. And I hope that the people around you will recognize it and, you know, begin to see. You know, when I, when I was a, in the hunt field, you know, everyone thought I was a very wealthy man because I'd always have these incredible horses that they thought. But, well, they were all horses that had been given to me because somebody else couldn't ride them. And I retrained them and made them into something beautiful, just as you are doing with this one. So it's wonderful. And I love thoroughbred horses. I grew up in Kentucky, you know, retraining thoroughbreds from the time I was a kid. And, uh, and of course, those were the kind of horses that we had in those days, you know. So, uh, until the warm blood thing, this is what we had. If you were doing some kind of English riding, you were usually doing it on some kind of thoroughbred or some, you know, rangy thing that had come off the range, some mixed breed horse, you know, to get size and things like the horse with the flying tail, so to speak, and some of those. But, you know, we had to really know how to ride to make these horses. And it's sad today that we see so many people, um, you know, buying these very expensive horses and we see them just fall apart because the horses today have so much natural talent that they can do a lot even when they're hollow and upside down, but they fall apart just as quickly as any other horse. So, and, you know, sadly today people are jumping horses every day. Here in California, it's it's very common to see trainers who jump horses every day of their lives. And I'm not talking little jumps, I'm talking about four and five feet jumps. And of course, you know, the horses last a year or two and they're burnt out. And that's really sad because people never get to the place that you're going to get on this horse. That is, he's going to become a real companion for you and a real partner in this work. And I'm sure you're going to have a, a great time riding him cross country. I can just imagine how beautiful he would be. Uh, send me a photograph of some day, that someday when you're out in the hunt field. Uh, it's one thing I miss in California is those, you know, galloping across a big, beautiful green field. So once again, this is really nice. It could be a swinging a little more active, and it's just you know, it's just that little inconsistency is the only you know, which is the only thing I could say about this. Otherwise, it's just you know, just about as perfect as I could like it to be right there. Now that's where we want him to just go and stay, and I feel like you could just push him a little more open when you're in that, and just you know, about little by little, you'll get a bigger stride out of him. This is going to be really good. Really nice work, and I just love how calm this horse is. He just seems like a really wonderful, you know, one of those thoroughbreds that you get that's really a great horse. And if you get a good one, you know, to, to my mind, there's there's nothing better than a thoroughbred. And that's also why, you know, they're developing um, so much thoroughbred into these horses over in Europe. And so now the one thing I would say here is uh, this was a little bit useless, this sitting trot. I don't think this horse is really ready to sit to the trot. If you notice when you did, he hollowed and you can see the underside of his neck there. So that tells me he's really not strong enough to sit to the trot and he's becoming very short behind when you do it. So you're only doing it for a few moments today, but I wouldn't do that much. And when you do, I'd like you to take a look at my video about developing the sitting trot. You know, you want to sit when the horse is all the way down in a stretch. You know, if he 
can't stay there in that stretch when you put your weight on. If he pops his neck right back up, that tells you it probably hurt his back and he's just not quite got enough strength. And just from looking at this horse's back, I would say that that's true. I'm not seeing enough develop in there for something to sit on. So when you're in that position right there, that's when you'd want to sit, but only sit for like three strides at a time. Stay on a big circle, you know, and just do three sides and right back out of the saddle again, three strides right back out of the saddle, but only as long as the horse can maintain that position over his back. So be careful about that sitting trot stuff. I, I know you told me in your thing you're not doing very much of that, and that's what I'd say. I don't think he's really ready for much of that. But what else you're doing here is really good. Now, once you get him in that position, I'd like to see if he can just open up that stride just a little bit, just send him on. You know, I feel like a little, just a little tap of your leg or something there would just send him on a little bit more so he could just get a little more action out of his back end. But other than that, it's really wonderful. Right there, that's where you want him to be. That is so beautiful to watch. You know, I can just imagine this horse becoming a a wonderful uh, cross country horse. Got an, and I love what you'll see his canter here in a moment. I of course have already seen it, and um, you know I'm always curious when people get the canter. But this is one of those. You know, my rule of thumb is if the horse can't canter over its back, we don't canter. You know. And because the horse simply doesn't have enough strength. Now, this is one of those horses, and I would say it's probably, you know, one in a couple of hundred that I see who, and, and, it's, and it is often thoroughbred horses because they are bred to, uh, to canter and gallop. He gets over his back actually really beautifully in the canter. And, uh, and so, therefore, the canter is good for him. As long as you can work the horse over its back and he's not hollow, whatever you're doing is good. That's kind of Mr. Oliveira's thing. If you read his book, I highly recommend that, uh, Reflections on Equestrian Art. You know, as he says that, you know, anything anything that you do with his, with the horse, if it's working over its back and it's relaxed and working correctly, then it's it's classical, you know, because there is some argument about which, which movements are classical, which are not. Well, that's what makes the difference, folks. It's simply whether the horse is working over its back. It's like understanding what a working trot. Working trot means when the horse is working over its back. It doesn't mean nine miles an hour or something like this. You know, or I have actually seen books that said it was, oh, between nine and 11 miles an hour. Well, you know, suppose you're on a 14 hand pony then what is it you know or you're on a 19 hand horse you know uh it's going to make a big difference so you can't think of that working trot or working canter working walk mean when the horse is working over its back now after the work we've done so far i want you to take a look at this walk is really good it's starting to swing so much better uh than it was to start out this is really really good now and, and looking very four beat and uh, and way more swinging than it was in the first one. I, once again, I think you can still get a little more, and I think you even do as we go on here in the tape. But that's really good, you know. Just try to get a little bit more out of it. Once again, when you come back to the walk, watch that you're not dropping those shoulders forward. Try to keep your shoulders flattened into your back. It's okay to keep your upper body forward a little bit, but it's just better if you keep your shoulder blades flattened in your back and your chest lifted just a little bit. <clears throat> in other words, just a little better posture. <clears throat> Once again here, he kind of flattens there a little bit there. Look how much better it looks, <coughs> excuse me, when he gets into that position. That's what we want. And when, when he gets there, then try to encourage just a little bit more out of him. I think just both in the trot and the walk, there's more to get there in terms of he could just swing a little bit more. I look forward to seeing um, some subsequent videos of this horse because, you know, you are so on the right track. He's going to develop absolutely beautiful. And uh, and just remember, you know, dressage, jumping is just dressage with fences in the way, as uh, great Jack Lagoff, the coach of our original three-day event team, uh, would say. And that's exactly it. So when you start, you know, adding in the poles on the ground and some jumps and grids, just be sure he's still working over his back when you're doing it. And then he will develop beautifully and he'll learn to bascule over the fence. If everyone knows that a bascule means the arc the horse's back makes over a fence. And once again, if you look at how many horses today seem to climb the fences, there's no bascule. They seem to go up like a rocket ship and plunge straight down on the other side. Now, why is it important for the horse to be round to the jump? Well, the reason for that is, is on the landing side, if a horse that is round will get its back end back under it much sooner, that is, it will take the pressure off of the front leg. So the kind of horse that jumps kind of straight up in the air like a deer, it also comes down straight down on the other side of the fence, it's landing very heavily on its legs, and it takes it longer to get its back up underneath it because it's coming down kind of straight down, so to speak, like a, an airplane crashing rather than an airplane coming in for a landing. It should look like they're coming in for a nice smooth landing. So once again, take a look at that when you're watching jumpers and see if you can't see the horses that bascule over a fence. That is, they use the whole length of their back in an arc over the fence as opposed to climbing the fence like a deer and plunging downward at the ground. 
And same thing here. Now, the one thing I would say here is, uh, um, and I love how you didn't take hold of his mouth. You just let him go into the canner and in from the walk, and that's perfectly fine. It might be good to go from the canner. You know, I tend to not want to skip gears until the horse is really round in every gear. But, you know, that was not bad at all. He lifted his head a little bit. No big deal. But this horse comes into such a nice round canner, you know, almost immediately for you. And once again, that to me means, okay, it's okay to canner. You're doing good. You know, generally speaking, that's the rule. If it can't stay over its back or you can't get him over the back within a short period of time, the gate isn't going to do you any good. I'm the same way about the trot. I never come out of the walk. Now, right there is where you want it. Now, did you see how it kind of smoothed out? At first, there was kind of a they're a clumpy kind of lifting of the shoulders. But when he started to get stretchy there, look how the canter seems to plane out. And it doesn't matter whether you're going down to a fence, galloping cross country, a polo player, for instance. If you watch the great polo players, their horses are in this kind of frame and they're not pulling backwards. You know, that's the difference between the people who really make up the time. You know, if you watch some of these great uh, South American polo players, they barely touch the mouths of their horses, and they're, they are able to gallop them around. And then you see, you know, the other guy who's yanking them up, you know, as they're going down, jerking them their head straight back, and they put on the brakes, and as well as killing the horse's legs. But we see jumper people doing the same thing. Think about it. You know, if you wanted to jump this horse, how lovely that would be just to roll down to a fence, you know. And people get all mystified, for instance, in jumping about, uh, getting a distance to a fence. Well, it's easy to get a distance to a fence if you have a horse working over its back and it's round. There's nothing to it at all. You just go right down to the fence. If you need to open a little bit, you put a little leg on and you find yourself right where you need to be. But hollow horses, they're always jerking them around. And I hear all these theories about, oh, teaching them to do the shuttle step, uh, shutter step, and you know, which we used to call chipping in. But now, now it's actually taught because they have so many people riding their horses upside down in the jumping and hunter ring. Um, but once again, that was not bad for a, for, a, for a horse as little developed as this one is to do a strike off that nicely from the walk is actually really quite nice. And once again, we'll see how nicely this horse gets over its back. And, and I agree with your ask, you know, she says she only canters this horse um, once or twice a week. And, and that's, that's about right. And, uh, you know, the way he's going here, that's just going to develop absolutely beautifully for you. And once again, I'm all for sitting up in a little bit of a two-point position, you know, when horses are not... Um, as strong over the back as we'd like them to be. You know, dressage people are just way too hung up on sitting up in that saddle and putting so much pressure on the horse's back, you know, especially the ones who, who sit kind of rounded and they drive their seats into the horse's back. Well, we want the horse's back to come up. So if we drive our seat down into the back of the horse, well, what do you think that does to its back? Uh, it makes it very sore in many cases, especially if they have an ill-fitting saddle. So this canter looks really good and is very useful for the horse. Once again, you know, he does a really, really nice job. Like right there. Look how nice and round that is. So once again, in time, over the next year and a half or so, you'll see this horse, if you continue this work, take a look at how he looks now. He looks kind of high-hipped, so to speak, you know. And what we see so many people thinking dressage is like pulling the head back up, but they're collapsing the bridge out from underneath them, you know, with these phenomenal moving European horse when they do that they get this phony thing they think is collection but it's really just the horse kind of springing kind of backwards off of its legs you know and uh, with a hollow back and that of course is why we see so many dressage horses today having to be injected at such an early age and in Europe even being put down at six to eight years old because their legs are already shot um but that's not going to happen to this one, I can see. I just love how quietly you ride. I mean, this is how, just imagine, okay, there's your hunter right there. Just canter down to a fence and you're there. That's just how it should be, you know. Um, it should look absolutely lovely like that. This is just really, really, really good. So everything you've done has been so useful on this horse. I think he's going to develop into something really special for you. And uh, I hope to see him again in the not too distant future. Really, really nice. But as I was saying, you know, of course, keep these videos. And that's why we are doing this video, because I want people to see how horses develop. That's what's been lost in our our horse society is that people, you know, it's kind of like our meat. We don't know where it comes from. You know, and kids today don't even know what a cow is or that a hamburger is part of one. You know, it's kind of like with riding, if you've never seen it done correctly, you know, you're back in the dark ages. And finally, with the video things, you know, I'm hoping that people will see that horses can be developed. Now, look how much better he's starting to swing a little bit. All this work has just made him looser and more swingy through the back. This is absolutely wonderful. And he's getting a little more hawk action here. You know, this isn't a huge strided horse, but he's going to develop a lot more stride than that as time goes on. He's what I call a good enough horse. This is a nice enough horse to do anything you want. Dressage, jumping, everything you want to do. 
cross country jumping, fox hunting. I believe you should do all things on horses. I've ridden the same horses in the morning and won a won a FEI dressage class and and a won a point to point on the afternoon in the afternoon on the same horse. You know who was very happy to do it. You know, so this is really, really good. Once again, you can, and once again, just look at how different it is when he does come up a little bit, how it changes. Once again, watch the back end, people. Watch the back end of horses and, and you know, come start looking at other horses that you see go by. You know, compare, get this idea of the outline. See the ball rolling over the ground when it gets in the right position. See how all the machinery of the horse's body seems to work together. Like when he gets there, look how loose he gets through his back. And also look how happy this horse is. I mean, this horse is completely happy to do this work. Horses become unhappy when riders, once again, try to force them. And when you see all these horses going around with their ears pinned back and grinding their tails and, you know, swishing their tails and grinding their teeth, you know, they're doing that for a reason. You know, wake up, people. The horse is trying to tell you something. And that's, you know, that's how good natured they are. But, you know, I've seen a few that have, you know, that people have pushed too far that weren't, you know, this kind of horses and they've end up being savages. I mean, that was savage people because they just, you know, there's a point if they ever find out that they're stronger than you are and they often do with people, you know, because the person finally pushes the envelope too far and the horse says, I've had enough. And, uh, and once they do that, you know, they're very hard to bring back again, you know, because they just get turned off and they'll never be really safe, pleasurable mounts. So they can be, but it takes a long, I've trained many of these kinds of horses, but it takes years and a lot of patience to do it. So great job on here. This is absolutely wonderful. I love everything that you're doing. Um, you didn't tell me where you were. Um, uh, must be in hunt country someplace you're talking about. Um, but very, very nice. Looks like you have a good school to work in. That's always important. Good footing. So again, there he could be a little more swinging and active. But you're getting right back there again. I know I don't have to keep telling you the same thing over and again because you get it there. A little bit deeper there, I'd like to see. And of course, try always try to end each thing with the best, you know. So, you know, you wouldn't want to, I see you're about to come back to a walk, but get that trot really right. There, now it's really starting to swing. And you could call that his working trot. That is, now it got a little too high. The pole came a little too high there and he got a little unecked again. So we let it on back down and find that perfect working trot. There's where it is for him. It's really about like that. Very, very, very nice. So we find the stretch and all we do is simply see how high we can bring the pole up without losing the back. That's, that's all this is about. And it's so simple once you understand it. And then you'll be patient with your horses and give them time to develop. And they do beautifully. Um, that's why uh, my wife is a saddle fitter for... Uh, um, we have a saddle company called um, Art to Ride Saddlery, and uh, you know she has a machine that she measures these horses' backs with, and it's just wonderful because she can you can really see them develop and see how the withers change over time, you know, and you get a you get a picture of that that is a drawing of how that's happening, you know, in the measurement. So it's great to see. Now there is really good. Right there is the best we've seen. That's a fantastic working trot for this horse. Right there. Very, very nice. I love it. She comes back to a walk. So once again, this has been Will Faber from Art to Ride uh, with our new friend, Lindsay, and her horse, Soon. And she's doing an absolutely wonderful job with this horse. Um, as I said, I would like to see just how he shod, just out of curiosity to myself. I'm always interested in seeing how horses are shod. Um, not that I'm seeing anything that I don't like here, but if you send me a couple of photographs and I will take a look at them just out of curiosity. But really great job. Once again, as far as you're concerned, just a little more consistent in the contact. Try not to slump over your shoulders a little bit, but otherwise absolutely fantastic. Thank you.